This podcast is about the unexplained death of a young woman, Laura Van Wye. I have reviewed and I will report on the contents of official case files provided by the police department that's investigating her possible homicide, including witness interviews and police reports. You will hear me provide my own opinions about these materials in the hopes of shedding new light on this cold case. It's important to stress, no person has ever been charged or convicted of killing Laura, and everybody identified in this podcast is innocent until proven otherwise. Previously on Bonaparte. You're brainwashed to think that teen pregnancy or having a baby before you finish college and get married is like the worst thing you can possibly do. It was like Sam had fulfilled her. Part of the impetus is to help Samson have some sort of sense of what might have happened. I think they were shocked by the custody proceedings, and they had no idea what lengths I would go to. I'll never forget that feeling. I was so elated. That was the happiest that I had probably been in years and years and years. She didn't want them to be able to find out in any way where she lived. But I can understand why she left. I mean, she needed to start over. We both did. For me, it's been such an ever-present thing in my life. You know, since I was a small child, the death of my mother kind of, like, shaped parts of my identity. I spoke with Samson over several weeks in the fall of 2020. Like everyone else that year, we spoke over Zoom with the occasional period of choppy internet and poor audio. So I'm sure you can picture it. I'm on my couch in my New York apartment, laptop on, well, my lap, and Samson is at a desk in an Iowa bedroom with dark green painted walls and dark wood molding and doors. He wears the same faded red baseball cap in all our interviews, and he's sporting a Burt Reynolds mustache that he's maybe just a bit too baby-faced to pull off. Although, at 25, he's already four years older than his mother was when she died. My mom had always been dead. You know, it was kind of like, um, it shaped my life, and I knew it made my friends uncomfortable, but it had, like, there was a constant truth in my life. Leanne definitely hid some things from me, but it wasn't like the, the basics, you know, I kind of knew. I had some decent structure of what was going on, and I appreciate her for that, you know? Samson was just 14 months old when Laura died. He has no conscious memories of her. He lived in Iowa until he was four, and then Leanne moved with him to California. Did you, do you remember ever asking for more detail, like, like around that time or earlier? Um, like sometimes, but... Mm -hmm. I also realized from a young age that Leanne wasn't comfortable talking about Laura. She would talk about it in like such a way that, you know, it was always kind of like curt and make me feel awkward. It was just kind of like, okay, like whatever. Um, you know, don't, don't bring up my birth mom that much. What kind of things would Leanne tell you about her? Just that like, you know, I looked a lot like her, which is definitely true. Like I, I have, a, I have pictures of my mom, and, like, I do have a striking resemblance to my mother, which mm -hmm. definitely uh, incentivized Leanne to, you know, like, run away with me. From Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci, I'm Jason Stavers, and this is Bonaparte. The two-and-a-half-year custody battle with Samson's father, Donnie, ends with Leanne being named Samson's permanent guardian in July of 1999. Leanne stays in Iowa City until the end of the year, shutting down her catering business. Then, she takes Samson on an extended trip to the West Coast, visiting family and camping. Leanne and Samson return to Iowa in June of 2000, when Samson is four years old. The investigation into Laura's death has gone cold, and it appears there may never be answers. In the absence of any official progress, Leanne is left with her suspicions. She doesn't trust Donnie or his family, and questions why they don't seem to be taking an interest in finding out what happened to Laura. Nor, in Leanne's view, does Donnie have much continued interest in Samson. According to sworn reports she submits annually to the custody court, after they get back to Iowa City, 
Leanne contacts Donnie to arrange for supervised visitation, but Donnie never schedules it, nor is he making his required child support payments. A few weeks before Samson turns five, Leanne arranges for him to speak with Donnie on the telephone on Father's Day. It would be the last time they would speak for over a decade. Soon after that call, Leanne and Samson move to California. Once they get to San Diego, Leanne is obligated by the custody court's final order to provide Donnie with Samson's telephone number and address. But she skirts this requirement by getting a post office box in another town. That's all she gives the Knights for an address. That's all she gives anyone. I did not know where Leanne lived for 15 years while she was in California. That's Ev, Samson's great aunt, who'd been friends with Leanne since high school. Ev, you'll remember from episode six, is the one who accompanied Leanne during those tense pickups at Donnie's house on Sunday evenings. I knew where the post office box was, but I could not have told you where she lived. She hid it from everybody, so nobody knew. For the first three years in California, Leanne doesn't even tell her own daughter Sarah where they are. Sarah comes out to visit when Samson is eight, and that's how she finds out where he and Leanne are living. Leanne is required to make annual reports to the custody court, however, sworn statements with details about Samson's health, his schooling, and other developments in his life. Donnie and his mother send letters and cards to Samson at the post office box. Leanne responds with thank you notes and updates on Samson's progress, things he's drawn or written in school. Donnie's mother, Rebecca, sends most of this mail. Donnie only sends a few cards, Leanne tells me, and once a book of jokes. A joke book that had really inappropriate adult-type jokes in them. Leanne doesn't share all of this mail with Samson. In her view, the material's inappropriate for a child of his age. She shows me some examples, and I I guess I see her point. It is a strange collection of short notes about day-to-day things, mostly written on Rebecca's Iowa House of Representatives stationery, along with photos apparently cut and pasted from magazines. Leanne thinks the messages are really for her, not Samson. The stationery to remind her that Donnie's family has power, an image of a bullseye to say that they are looking for her. I doubt it mattered much what the Knights sent in the mail. By the time she reaches California, Leanne is terrified of these people and convinced that they are responsible for her daughter's death. Whether or not her suspicions are true, or even fair, she's determined that Samson will grow up without their influence. I just felt like a child only needs to know what they need to know. As far as Sam's day-to-day life, none of that was important. What was important was that he go to school, learn how to read, ride a bike, you know, have friends. By the time I spoke with Samson, I'd been reporting on Laura's story for over a year, and all that time, I'd been studying the details of his childhood. I still thought of him as a little kid, even when he showed up on my computer screen as a 25-year-old with a mustache. So I wanted to hear about the intervening 21 years, what he'd come to learn about Laura, and how he'd gotten back in touch with his father. As it turned out, Samson's memories start right at the point where my image of him leaves off, moving to California. I remember the drive. We had a big um, old white GM van, just very generic. We had a little uh, like 11 or 13 inch CRT TV, mm-hmm. but with a little VHS player, and it could hook up to the to the van, the battery, and I could just like watch. Uh, I think it was like The Lion King on repeat mm-hmm. for like 30 hours. Leanne said Samson had a stack of movies he could watch, but all he wanted to see was The Lion King, over and over. We moved to a suburb of San Diego called La Mesa. Mm -hmm. And we lived in a little condo there. There was a neighbor kid named Julian, who was my homie. We always like go to the the pool and stuff. We stepped on a bee when I was five, a dead bee, and that really hurt. I remember flipping out. (laughs) It was like, oh my God, the pain, you know, your first bee sting. The first kind of experience with pain are definitely some of my most vivid memories. Leanne enrolls Samson in a small Lutheran school nearby. It's still there, four and a half stars on Yelp. The neighborhood is diverse and youthful, striving immigrants looking for the California dream. 
it's like 25% Filipino and you know San Diego has San Diego has a lot of Asians but yeah and so you know I uh, had a lot of Filipino food had a lot of Filipino friends I love Lumpia to this day Leanne starts a new career working as a paralegal she also reconnects with someone from her past a man named Steve Desterhoft who she was with for several years after leaving Laura's father Bill Samson tells me he wasn't ever really close with Steve but when I ask about specific memories, he's quick to recall how they bonded over a common interest in technology. Really, one of my most distinctive memories is when um, my stepdad, Steve, went to go buy a computer Mm -hmm. at uh, Fry's Electronics. It was like the city on the shining hill. It was like going into here, it's like, oh my God, there's, it's this gigantic warehouse of tech and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was like so cool. And, you know, he built, he built his, uh, his desktop when I was like nine and he showed me what he was doing. It was kind of like dad working on the car. Uh, I remember very much he let me put in the power supply when he was mm-hmm. nearly done. I was like holding in my hands and he's like, that's the, that's the heart of the computer. It's like, that's mm-hmm. what makes the blood flow, you know, the electricity go. It was kind of like, uh, let the kid put the final, uh, the final bolt on the car job, whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, Played a lot of little video games on that, little flash games and stuff. Samson's interest in computers and video games grows. And eventually, he figures out that he can turn that hobby into a moneymaker. He does get an allowance from Leanne for household chores, but like most teenagers, he doesn't think it's enough. I definitely wanted to make more money, you know? I wanted to get as much money as possible. Mm -hmm. And so, like, my first kind of foray into trying to make my own money was... I was like 13 going on 14 and there was a game called RuneScape that was kind of like a massive, massively multiplayer online game where people would like trade gold for Mm -hmm. items and such. Mm -hmm. There was also like a black market where people would trade gold for real life money on PayPal. Samson's talking about something called gold farming. The way these games work, there's an in-game currency, often just called gold, that you earn by doing various things in the game And then you can spend that on items that make your character more powerful or make the game more interesting. Some players will devote all their time just to earning this in-game gold, then sell it to other players for real-world money. But if you've got computer skills, you can do this one better. Samson, at 13 years old, figured out that he could run software on commercial computer servers to conduct the RuneScape gold farming for him. He convinced Steve and Leanne to let him use their credit card to rent the servers he needed. And I used those to run uh, RuneScape bots, which were essentially little uh, scripts that would play the game for you while you were sleeping. Then every few days, Samson would collect the gold that his bots had farmed and sell it for cash. I made like about probably about $100 a month but uh, eventually it ended. Why it ended, Samson and Leanne recall differently. According to Samson, Steve and Leanne, they just got tired of paying the tab to run those servers. It was costing them $40 a month, he told me. But he didn't explain why he didn't just pay the server costs out of his $100 a month profits. Leanne remembers this episode differently. (laughs) Oh yes, that one cost me $1,000. It was this grand scheme that he would get these bots that would do all the mining in the background. Now, these programs are set to search for bots because they don't want people doing that. He got caught and shut down, and so he lost all his gold. But yeah, he convinced me to invest in his business, and I lost (laughs) $1,000. And he's 14 years old. It's not really knowable anymore just how all this went down, how much money was lost or made. But it doesn't matter. Our memory for facts might be unreliable, but we're pretty good at holding on to the important stuff. I was a little proud. Even though I lost all that money, I was kind of proud of him. So around that time, do you, at that point, you, you call Leanne mom? You, do you think she is yeah. your mom? She actually made it very clear to me, you know, when I was a young kid, you know, starting even first grade, you know, I knew that my, uh, my birth mom was dead mm-hmm. and that my grandma was raising me, but I still just called her mom. By Samson's 12th birthday, the Knights have stopped sending any mail to the post office box. 
Samson remembers the post office box and the birthday cards, but they don't appear to have had much impact. You know, like every once in a while, I'd kind of see things. I'd never really look into it. Uh, I never really looked at the letters, but there were birthday cards and little things, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just hated it. I hated the whole experience because I'd always have to drive up there with Leanne, and it was a, a long-ass drive. Do you remember any conversations, or did you, do you have an understanding of, of if your father was anywhere? I mean, I knew that he existed, uh-huh. um, and... Leanne, in very simple terms, just like told me he was a bad dude. And so I just kind of accepted that. And so that was where they left it. But the questions about what happened to Samson's mother and who his father was wouldn't stay buried forever. I think it was not until he was about 11 that he started asking questions about his mother and how she died. And at that point, I told him that she was in a terrible accident and found by the side of the road because I didn't want to discuss murder with an 11-year-old. But he never asked who his real dad was, never, until he was 16. Finding out more about his family, about Donnie and about Laura, was probably inevitable. But what specifically triggers Samson's interest is paperwork. Everybody knew me as Sam Thomas. Thomas had been Leanne's last name when she moved to California. And that's the surname she'd used when she enrolled Samson in school. But his birth certificate says Samson Knight. Then at 16, he has to sign up for national standardized tests. And the bureaucracy of that process, it rejects his efforts to register as Samson Thomas. They needed, like, birth certificates and actual, you know, identification. And then it was like, well, your name isn't Sam Thomas. You're never legally changed as Sam Thomas. Your grandmother just enrolled your school in kindergarten as Sam Thomas because, you know, she didn't want me to be calling myself Knight. Then his high school catches on as well. I went to school and they're like, it'd be like fraud to keep you enrolled as Sam Thomas. So you're going to have to go as your normal name at school. The new name is a daily reminder of what he doesn't know about his own past. It kind of like drove me to uh, like take the red pill or whatever you want to call it, just dive into um, the court documents. Leanne tells him that his mother had been murdered and gives him a copy of Officer Clemens' report with a description of Laura's injuries and an interview with a truck driver who found her. It was heavy for him. I asked Leanne if Samson had said anything to her after he read the report. He didn't say much. I don't remember what he said. Must not have been much. But while Samson didn't talk to Leanne about reading the report of his mother's death, things did begin to change. This whole thing just blew him up. From the time he was 16 to 18, his grades faltered. He started smoking marijuana. And just generally his attitude went down the tubes. Samson doesn't deny any of this. I mean, I was just a contrarian little asshole. You know, I'd do pretty much the opposite of whatever they told me because I'd be personally offended that they were telling me, a teenager, what to do. He'd always been a strong student, but he told me he was a self-motivated one. He wasn't trying to please Leanne or anyone else. Good grades for me were a... uh, They weren't like a means to an end, they were the end. At 16 though, Samson starts finding other interests. I go on these forums and I read all these interesting posts about, called trip reports, (laughs) (laughs) about people taking various drugs and uh, journaling their experience. And that got me very interested in a lot of different psychotropic substances. And as a techie dude, I, ordered a lot of these substances online with bitcoins and uh, you know I had them delivered to my house <laughs> in his junior year of high school Samson goes up to San Francisco to look at colleges he spends the day with his mother's friend Laura Barron a lifetime before Laura Barron had been rowed out to a broken down sailboat in Sausalito to see Laura and Donnie now here was her son the same age Laura had been then. He is like his mom, and he looks just like her. (laughs) He's a wild child, thrill seeker, 
who likes to push things too, and uh, is so, so smart, both of them. I was kind of uh, not a demon child, but I was a rowdy kid. It's an old story, but one with particular poignancy in this family. Samson's grandmother, Leanne, fell for the motorcycle riding bad boy and got pregnant at 19. Samson's father, Donnie, left home at 17, fleeing an abusive father. And Samson's mother, Laura, moved out at 16 and then ran off to California with Donnie a year later. Just like his parents and grandparents before him, Samson veered off the path set by his early promise. But his guardrails, internal or external, were stronger. Sure, on weekends, Samson and his friends would head into the canyons around their neighborhood with whatever new drug Samson had discovered on the internet. So yeah, he was pushing boundaries. But he never moved out. He didn't end up in rehab. Far from it. He was third in his class when he graduated, but he was tied for valedictorian before he started kind of going downhill in this weird spiral. And I'm sure it was a lot. But we had a psychiatrist for him during this time and a, also a regular therapist just to try to help him deal with it. So we tried to get him all the help we could during this really difficult time of him learning the truth about everything. Midway through Samson's senior year, though, there was a frightening new development. We were flying back from Minnesota for Christmas vacation, and his girlfriend picked him up, and uh, I took the luggage, and I was following behind them. She called me on her cell phone. She says, something's wrong with Sam. He's, he's having a seizure, I think, and I said, go to my house immediately. I said, go to the hospital. She goes, where is the hospital? I'm like, how can you be 18 years old and not know where the hospital is? But that's kids, I guess. I mean, I guess Sam wouldn't know where the hospital is either. So I said, just go to my house. So I drove up behind them and he was seizing in her car. And so he was sort of somewhat conscious and got him into my car. And I drove up the five, like going 100 miles an hour to the ER. And then they just kept happening. It's pretty much like I'm doing something and then I instantly go unconscious and wake up about 30 minutes later. Mm -hmm. um, feeling like I just got hit in the head with a hammer or something. We went to um, went to all the neurologists and got an MRI and et cetera. They went through all the tests and even put him on epileptic seizure medicine, but it didn't do any good because he doesn't have epilepsy. So I was diagnosed with kind of a catch-all, we don't know what to diagnose you disease called non-epileptic attack disorder. Non-epileptic seizures are difficult to treat and somewhat mysterious. They can be associated with drug use and with some physical conditions. But most commonly, they stem from underlying psychiatric distress. Many people suffering these seizures experienced a profound childhood trauma, one that may have been blocked from conscious memory. Samson has no memory of Laura or of the night she died, and we don't know what, if anything, he witnessed. But whatever happened that night, being abruptly separated from his mother must have been traumatic. Laura was an almost constant presence in his life. Then she was gone. Samson was just 14 months old when Laura disappeared from his life. For the first few days, he looked for Laura around the house. Then he began touching photographs of her and sobbing endlessly. At times, he became angry, throwing objects and kicking and striking things. He wouldn't sleep and he developed an unusual speech pathology using his own words for common objects, a private vocabulary only Leanne could understand. So Leanne took him to bi-weekly play therapy sessions and to a speech therapist. In a report for the custody case, his counselor recounted that for months, Samson made all his play about guns. He acted out shooting bad guys and monsters. He told the counselor that his father used guns, though Donnie denied that there were any guns in the house. Samson learned the word die, the counselor noted, and he made all his toys die over and over again. After the abrupt loss of his mother, 
Samson spent the next year being ferried between Leanne and Donnie every weekend. Two people who couldn't stand one another and whose parenting styles, whose households were worlds apart. Samson's counselor spoke with both Leanne and Donnie and made notes of these conversations in her report. Reading these notes now, you get the sense that Leanne and Donnie, they couldn't help but litigate their custody case to the counselor. In her report, the counselor's highly complimentary of Leanne's parenting, but it's also Leanne she sees most often. Samson sometimes tells the counselor, quote, Daddy is mean to me. The counselor also writes that in his play, Samson often beats up or shoots a character named Daddy. But when the counselor asks him about his actual visits with Donnie, Samson refuses to talk about them. Sometimes he holds a finger to his lips and says, Shh. What do you think was motivating you to get in, get in touch with your father and, and his family? I didn't want to live uh, ignorant of this other half myself. And yeah, it's kind of just like my, my duty, I guess, for lack of a better word, to go and talk to these people. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself. I continued to avoid them. Samson contemplates looking for his family for months, but he hesitates. Leanne hasn't forbid him from contacting the Knights. If she had, Samson, the contrarian, probably would have started looking for them right at that moment. But still, he knows she doesn't want him to. He holds off and doesn't pursue his interest in his father during his senior year of high school. Despite his academic struggles and the seizures, he graduates third in his class, and he's accepted at UC Berkeley, where he's thinking of majoring in biology so he can go on to get a degree in pharmacology. Always in the back of his mind, though, there's unfinished family business. I, I planned for a while, maybe like a year or so, to contact my dad when I was 18. Samson's birthday is in August, but just a few months before his self-imposed deadline, he reconsiders. In the summer of 2013, you know, I was graduated, I was accepted into university, I was going to, going to school in September, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm turning 18, my grandma has no say anymore. Um, and then it was kind of just like one afternoon, I was like, well, let's do it now. It's 2013. Finding people online is pretty easy for a digital native kid like Samson. After all that buildup, the search is an anticlimax. Donnie still lives in Iowa, and while he's not active on social media, his wife Taryn is a regular on Facebook. I was like, found this person called Taryn Knight. And I'm like, well, she lives in Iowa City, you know, or she lives close to it. And, you know, it's a little sleuth, and I was able to pre pretty much confirm she was my stepmom. Taryn has actually set up a website called Samson Knight's Iowa Family, hoping he will find it and contact them. It's mostly pictures of her and Donnie's daughter, Samson's half-sister. Samson sends Taryn a Facebook message. I woke up the next morning with like 14 messages from like random aunts, uncles, and grandparents and such. I was more uh, overwhelmed than excited, I guess, just to say. <laughs> You know, it's just like a lot of people I'd never heard of trying to get in touch with me. And then, yeah, like soon after she gave me her home phone and soon after, you know, we talked on the phone with my dad and my little sister and such. The reunification of the Knights snowballs from there. First, they make plans for Samson to come for a visit around his 18th birthday. He sees his father for the first time in 15 years, meets his half-sister, and returns to the place of his birth. Then, after a short visit in Iowa, he heads back to California to start college. But things don't go as planned. The freedom of living on his own and the temptations of a college campus, they overwhelm Samson. He gets crosswise with his residence hall and has to take a leave of absence. He decides to take the opportunity to get to know his father's family, and he moves in with his paternal grandmother, Donnie's mother, Rebecca. I uh, cooked a lot of pizza, a place called Pizza Ranch. If anything, it was good for me. It gave me time during a critical period of my life to hang out with loved ones and stuff. The recollections he shares with me of that time are vague, but pleasant. It's the lead up to the 2016 presidential election, and Rebecca gives him a crash course in politics. At a campaign event, he shakes hands with Bernie Sanders, as one does in Iowa. Are you seeing a lot of yeah. your father? 
I saw him, you know, pretty frequently at every like family gathering and he'd, he'd come out every month or so. My dad's a big gamer. He's big into like racing games and car mm-hmm. stuff. Um, play a lot of Mario Kart. <laughs> Samson gets back to Berkeley eventually. He gets into his first long-term relationship with a girlfriend who's also active in politics. While they're together, Samson's girlfriend runs for a seat on the school board in her nearby hometown and becomes the youngest person ever elected. The relationship doesn't make it to graduation, but it's another guardrail, another thing that guides Samson back onto a productive path. Talking with Samson, the parallels between him and his parents and grandparents are everywhere. The intelligence and the stubbornness, the teenage rebellion, of course. I'm also struck by the role of strong women in Samson and Donnie's lives. Rebecca and Leanne, dueling matriarchs. Samson's college girlfriend, the politician. Donnie's wife, Taryn, whose website for Samson is like a lighthouse hoping to call him home. And Laura, the shooting star that brought them all together. Some of the parallels might just be coincidences, but then again, they might not. After college, Samson finds a job in Hawaii. I did AmeriCorps. Um and, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, I moved out to Honolulu, worked at a homeless shelter for about six or seven months. Both Samson and his father were 24 years old when they moved to Hawaii. While they were there, Donnie and Laura lived in a tent on the beach. I wonder if they ever visited the homeless shelter where Samson would work two decades later to get a hot meal or take a shower. Despite Samson's maturation, his seizures continue and are frequent enough that they interfere with his job. The seizures themselves are disruptive, and then it can take a day or more to recover. Samson eventually takes a disability leave, and he makes plans to head back to the mainland and move in with Leanne. First, though, he wants to visit Iowa, and he's there living with his father when the COVID-19 pandemic takes hold. What was supposed to be a short visit extends, and Samson is still in Iowa when he speaks with me in October. Eventually, he moves out of his father's house and gets his own place, still in Wellman, near Donnie. A year later, just before I recorded this episode, Leanne tells me that he's moving to Cedar Rapids, just north of where he was born, Iowa City. What's more, his seizures have stopped. In early 2020, Leanne suggested Samson try a form of therapy that she'd had success with. It's called Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Therapy, and it's designed specifically for people with distress caused by traumatic memories. The U.S. Department of Defense relies on it for PTSD treatment. Samson doesn't finish the full course of treatment, but either what he does is enough, or he's otherwise found a way to resolve whatever has been behind these symptoms. 20 years ago, Samson traveled from Iowa to California in a white van watching The Lion King over and over. In the film, the lion cub Simba grows up in exile, far from his mother and father. Eventually, though, he returns, reunites with his mother, and avenges his father's murder. Will there be a storybook resolution to Samson's dilemma? Or has there already been one? To me, Samson expresses no uncertainty about his mother's death. It's the first thing he talks about in our conversation, after some small talk about the weather and the pandemic. I was always kind of sold this, this very black and white story by my, my grandmother that kind of like, dad killed mom, which is super reductionist and something that I just flat out don't believe after getting to know my paternal side of the family better. You know, my view on it was like, she got hit by a truck walking, that didn't have his brights on or something because it's fucking small town Iowa, like the town she was in like 500 people, everything's two lane roads with no, there's a ditch, there's no shoulders. So there's no nowhere to walk. So you just walk along, you know, the far lane of the road. And then, you know, it's 3 a.m., 4 a.m., pitch black. And I can see, I can see it happening in Iowa. There are obvious factual issues with this understanding, of course. Laura was in Missouri, for one thing. And more importantly, Route 136 actually has a wide shoulder where Laura was found. And there's no ditch just level ground. It was a full moon that night, and even a truck with no headlights would have been visible a thousand yards away. And then there are all the other puzzling facts we've spent this podcast unpacking. 
But if I were Sam, I doubt I would dwell on those facts much either. Samson's version is tragic, but it's also clean and in the past. I've heard secondhand that this is more or less how the Knight family tells the story, to the extent any of them ever talk about it. I just like to avoid talking to uh, kind of like let old demons lie or whatever, what have yeah. you. I wouldn't, I don't like to talk about that with my dad. It's a subject that's kind of like hard to get through and always uncomfortable. The Knights have other myths they've built up around this case. Donnie has told people that Leanne received a large settlement from the trucking company, which isn't true. As far as I know, he's not told Samson that. But I suspect that Samson's understanding of his childhood departure from Iowa comes directly from Donnie. From what I understand, like, the custody case of me wasn't completely finished. When Leanne, like, actually, uh, my grandmother, like, got, like, tentative custody and then just, um, she was just kind of like, screw this. Like, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to win the case. I don't need to appear in court anymore for the rest of this stuff. And she just kind of like took me and disappeared. That may even be how Donnie remembers it today. But the court records tell a different story. Donnie signed a settlement agreement authorizing Leanne to take Samson to California. Then, when he revoked that agreement, he took the case to trial and lost a definitive court ruling which produced the same end result. And even then, it was another year before Leanne moved to California. All of this, the facts about Laura's death, the facts about what happened afterwards, is evident from court filings and police reports. But if Samson pulls on those threads, how far does the unraveling go? The story of Laura Van Wy's death is the story of a fractured family and a divided community. Caught astride the chasm, trying to hold these sundered lives together within his own, is Samson. Leanne, the woman that raised him, fears that Donnie had something to do with Laura's death. Donnie and his family detest Leanne. Everyone is fighting over the memory of a woman, Laura, of whom Samson remembers nothing. Whatever peace he has made, it can only be a truce, so long as the mystery of his mother's death is unsolved. Can this truce hold? Should it? I've asked my interview subjects whether they want Annie to solve this mystery, for Laura's death to be solved and anyone responsible brought to justice. Samson, of course, thinks there's nothing to solve. Leanne and Laura's father, Bill, still burn for justice. Others feel differently. I still feel like it never goes anywhere. You know, it just goes in circles and circles and circles, and nobody knows still what happened, and people keep trying to dive back into it, and it just never seems to go anywhere. That's Laura's sister, Sarah. My position has always been that it would just dive our whole family back into that trauma, and I, I don't know if it's desirable. You know, people have a sense on the outside that justice must be served, but when you're the family that has to go through the ins and outs of these things, it's very traumatic. Um, it is what it is. It, somebody took her and she's not coming back, you know. So I don't really care who did it. Several people told me they want the case solved for Samson. He deserves to know the truth, they say, and that seems inarguable. But at least in my experience, truth is a slippery subject. Facts, Jim Trainum's hard facts, these can be ascertained and documented, set down in the clipped language of police reports and lawyer filings. But truth? We make our own truth, sometimes based on facts, sometimes based on what we need. Annie, for her part, has no doubt. I want the truth. I'm not interested in anything but the truth. I'm not interested in revenge. I don't care about that. I want to know what happened. So she's pushing ahead. A reward, a website, participating in this podcast, and steady pressure on law enforcement to keep Laura's case active. It's all starting to break through the years that have encrusted over the events of October 26th, 1996. I think the dam is really starting to break. The podcast really has people talking I'm now hearing from people in the community on basically a daily basis, people who know people who may have been involved, et cetera, and I'm really hopeful that someone will come forward with something actionable soon. 
it's really remarkable how much this has people talking and reaching out. That's next time on Bonaparte. Bonaparte is a production of Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci and is written and hosted by me, Jason Stavers. For Imperative Entertainment, the executive producers are Jason Hoke and Andrew Richards. For Vespucci, the executive producers are Daniel Turkin and Johnny Galvin, with story guidance from Matt Willis and Pete Sale. The series producer is Thomas Curry. The executive producer is Emma Weatherill. Original music by Thomas Ross Fitzsimmons. Audio mix and sound design by Peregrine Andrews at Moving Air. Visit the Champion for Laura Van Wy Facebook page or championforlaura.com for more information about how you can help. If you like the show, please make sure to leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.